Uh, good evening and welcome to this forum on the override that we will be voting on as a community on Tuesday. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the officers, directors, and members of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association that is sponsoring this forum. And I'm Jerry Budger, I'm the president, and I will be moderating this evening. I want to thank a few members of our board for the hard work they've put in on getting this program going. Uh, Bob Reckman did yeoman's work putting together the, many of the pieces of this, which were rather difficult at times, and I appreciate all the work he did. Uh, Fred Zimnock and Denise Quenneville from our board will be timekeepers. They will hold up a sheet when you have a minute left. They will hold up another sheet that says stop, and at that point, stop. Uh, Wendy Newton and our treasurer, Joan Rasool, are at a table down in the back of the room. They have applications for membership. If you are a property owner, if you are a resident or a business owner in Ward 3, we'd love to have you join this organization and partner with us on the good things that we are doing for the community. Few ground rules for this evening. We are going to stick to the issue of the override and only the issue of the override. And just so that we're clear about what we're discussing, I want to read you the question as it appears on the ballot on Tuesday. It said, shall the city of Northampton be allowed to assess an additional $2,500,000 in real estate and personal property taxes for the purposes of funding the operating budgets of the city and the public schools for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2013? That is the question we're discussing and the only question we're discussing tonight. We will not allow any pers political or personal attacks. Um, and um, when people get up to speak later on, please give your name and address for the record. Um, we will ask you no PDAs, personal displays of affection like applause or cheering for anyone until this forum is over. We'll give a general round of applause for everyone at one time. And please turn off all cell phones because they can not interfere with the microphone. I want to introduce the two speakers that have uh, agreed to come here tonight and present their various cases to the city and to the ward. Mayor David Narkowitz is going to be speaking in favor of the override. Ward 7 City Councilor Gene Casey is going to be speaking in opposition to the override. The format will consist of three distinct parts. The first part, each of these gentlemen will get five minutes to make an opening presentation. After that, we will have an hour of questions, and we will work out the procedure um, after the, the first part is done. You'll be able to ask questions to them, and we will rotate who gets the question first. The first person will get two minutes to answer. The other speaker will get two minutes to respond, and we will rotate between the two as to who gets the questions first. The third part of this, for 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how much time we have left, we're going to invite the members of the audience to go to that microphone and to speak for two minutes on why you favor or oppose the override. And we're going to try to do a pro, a con, a pro, a con, a pro, a con to keep it balanced and keep it even. So that's the format for this evening. And without further ado, we're going to start. It was by agreement of the two, can of the two, can of the two speakers. Uh, Mayor Narkowitz will speak first for five minutes. And the floor and the microphone are yours. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Jerry, and uh, it's great to be with you here tonight. I want to thank the um, Ward 3 Neighborhood Association for sponsoring tonight's forum and allowing this opportunity uh, for all of you to come out and ask questions and learn more about the override proposal. So uh, as, as some of you probably have followed, uh, this year's budget has been very challenging as we, be, as we try to create a balanced budget for fiscal year 2014, which begins on July 1st. Um, I did a series of town hall budget meetings around the city, uh, meeting with citizens to talk about some of the challenges that we're facing, and also looking at some of the historic issues that really have brought us to where we are today. So essentially, uh, the crux of it is, in order for us to be able to provide the same level of services uh, in our city, our schools, public safety, that we're providing now in fiscal year 14, that requires uh, increases that don't match our revenue. Our, the revenue that we're allowed to raise, um, and this is in the form of the state aid that we receive, um, as well as uh, uh, property tax, which is currently capped at 2.5%, um, does not match what it, what it requires for us to continue to provide the services that we're providing right now. 
Um, so that's forced us to make some difficult decisions in putting forward a budget. Um, and it includes some very significant cuts to services. Uh, on the, as of last Thursday, because of some changes in the school budget, um, 18, equivalent of 18 full-time employees uh, will need to be laid off in both the school side and the city side. That includes four police officers, uh, positions being eliminated, as well as uh, uh, about 13 on the school side. Uh, full-time equivalents. It's going to have major impacts, particularly on the school side at all levels, including here at Bridge Street School, at JFK Middle School, uh, impacts uh, in subject areas, in arts, in music, um, high school busing is being eliminated in order to balance the school budget. Um, and I believe that the, 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 the cuts were of a magnitude that this required us uh, to put this question to the voters uh, in a Proposition 2 and a half override. I want to point out that in the budget process, we um, have worked very hard to try to find as much savings as we can. I've done a lot of work, including in last year's budget, to look at consolidating departments, uh, at trying to find efficiencies wherever we can. Uh, we began the year with a $2.5 million gap. Uh, we were able to lower that gap uh, to its current 1.4 in what I consider a very historic breakthrough in the, in the area of health insurance. Um, I asked the City Council to adopt municipal health insurance reform last fall. They did, and this year we negotiated a historic agreement with our unions about moving the city's health insurance into the State Group Insurance Commission, or GIC, health plan, which is the same health plan that all state employees have. So that's going to allow us to save about 900000 in fiscal year uh, 14, uh, and in future, in, in, in calendar year 14, over a million dollars, and hopefully lots more savings going forward. Um, so we're left with the 1.4 million. What I've tried to do in presenting the proposal, I'm going to stand, is I've tried to present a multi-year proposal, not just what's going to help us get out of the jam we're in in FY14, but actually a, a, a multi-year proposal where we take the $2.5 million uh, which gets added to, uh, to that base levy. And we try to maintain those level services that we have in fiscal year 14. We're not going to use all the money in the first year, however. We're going to put, uh, we're gonna put uh, some of it aside in what I'm calling a fiscal stability or override stabilization account, about 773000 of it. Um, it's going to allow us to, to, to fund those positions in the schools that are going to be cut to restore those police officers and all the other services that we'll be losing uh, without this additional revenue. It then puts us in a position going into 2015 where I believe using a very uh, conservative and, and, and historic based estimates in terms of our receipts, in terms of spending, that's going to allow us to maintain level services in 2015 and still leave us again with a little bit of an excess which we will put into this stabilization account, which I might add can only be touched with a two-thirds vote of the City Council. We then continue on to 16, on to 17, um, and this allows us the capacity to be able to provide those level services over the next four fiscal years. So we're not right back where we started again in the next budget year. So that's the proposal that I've put forward. Again, I, uh, I welcome the opportunity to talk with you. And again, I believe very strongly we've, we've availed ourselves of every local option that we've been given by the state. We have voted to accept a new local meals tax, a local hotel tax. We've adopted the CPA. Uh, and we've done health insurance reform. We've used every tool we can, and this is really the last tool that we have. And that's why I am putting this forward and supporting it. Uh, and I hope you will uh, join me in supporting it on Tuesday. Uh, it gives me pleasure to introduce Ward 7 City Councilor Gene Tacey, who will have five minutes to make a presentation against the override. The floor and the microphone are yours, Councilor. I remember when the two and a half override was first proposed, I was the red and white bumper stickers that said stop prop two and a half vote no question two um, my father was Northampton firefighter uh, but I also remember the referendum that went along with it with the question in the referendum I don't know if anybody remembers what it was but it was 40 percent of all of the funds given to the state 40 percent of the, all the money that was given to the state would come back to the cities and towns as local aid but it wasn't a mandate so anyway, that never happened. We can tell that has never happened. The, uh, so the, the anguish 
that this override will place on many, um, including the elderly, disabled, or uh, even uh, um, single moms and things such as that, that are barely hanging on. They are barely hanging on. I have uh, people on my street. They've been in their house for 114 years. They can't hang on. The family has owned that house for 114 years. There's no mortgage. She's disabled. She's on $800 a month, and $315 of that is for her heating budget. It's it, this anguish that this will put on people is is tremendous. The and some of the tactics. I, I, I here's a flyer off the wall at the Leeds Post Office. Vote yes for our children. Vote yes on June 25th for the Proposition 2.5 override. If you rent your home, the override will cost you nothing. By voting yes, you can help your kids get a better education. I spoke with every landlord in the city. If you rent your home, your rent's going up. Uh, and it's $2.5 million rather than $1.4 million. My problem with some of the bullet points, too, on the yes flyer uh, the drastic cuts in state aid are the single largest reason we face this fiscal crisis. We asked Peter Colcott, or the YES Committee asked Peter Colcott at the meeting at the uh, JFK school if we could get some more money. If they're going to raise our taxes, they're going to do, this is all about the budget, raise our taxes uh, and raise fiscal, raise the uh, the capital gains taxes, and they're going to cut uh, sales tax. And all of this package together was going to generate $2 billion in revenue. Well, fine and dandy, when we asked if we would get more of that money back to the city of Northampton, our representative said, no, because the formula does not allow for it. The formula does not allow for us to get any more money back, even if we put more money in. So I get... I get a little upset sometimes when we pass out grant money. I, I'm a, by the way, I'm a supporter of David Narkowitz and always have been. He stood before us with $750,000 worth of grant money, two, a $400,000 check and a $326,000 check. One was to build the bikeway from uh, the trestle on Damon Road down to the Connecticut River, and then the other 327 or 8,000, I forget where that was going, but it was grant money. And he said, that was the good news. The bad news is we're cutting special education. We're cutting Chapter 70. We're cutting veteran services. We're cutting transportation. So they give us $750,000 in grant money, which has all these strings attached. We have to use it in this particular spot. If they had given us that $750,000 in unrestricted local aid, lobby, 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 your representatives, your senators, your congressmen. Never mind the grant money. Give us the money to the cities and towns where we, we know where we need that money. We can fund our schools. We can fund our police. We can fund everything. Knock off the grant money. Our planning department takes in 10 times as much money as it costs us to, hold, to have the planning department in grant money. And all of that grant money comes with strings attached. We do not get a chance to utilize that money where we see fit. The federal government used to give us 1.75% of our entire city budget. They're now down to 0.3%. Something is wrong. Change the formula. Lobby your, lobby your congressmen, your senators. Hammer them. He's got a brand new office down on Pleasant Street, Jim McGovern. I've slipped door, cards under his door. I'm waiting for an audience with him now. Uh, I have to stop. Okay. I could have went on for an hour. Okay. Um, we're now into part two, which are questions. And since the mayor was the first speaker, the first question will go to Councillor Tacey. Is there anybody who wishes to ask a question? Um, Fellow in the green hat, you want to go to the microphone and give us your name and address? Okay. In Northampton. Name and ad name and address. Oh, David Corbett, Ward Ward, Fort Hill Terrace. Okay. In Northampton, we have a affordable wage 
coalition. Well, we asked all the employers to give a certain amount of money so they can afford to live in Northampton. What's this going to do to that? You're going to have two increases. Are the businesses going to be able to pay the money in taxes, in rents, and for employment? I have two minutes. Downtown business in the bid. If your property tax is $10,000, your bid fee is going to be $5,000. This is going to go up. go up they're not they're going to rents are going to go up if they rent the place and they're not going to be able to pay as much money to employees they're already hurting let's look at them they're closing now um, some are even in their in their stores and they haven't paid rent in nearly a year and they're still in Uh, so um, I did. I just wanted to go back quickly and just correct one point. There was the, the scene that was portrayed of me with the two checks uh, and saying that's the good news and then the bad news. The bad news was actually a threatened uh, mid-year cut. It turned out that the legislature actually overruled the governor and didn't make those cuts. Uh, and actually the governor has since even the cuts that he did have the authority to make, he's gone back on because revenues have been higher. So I just wanted to correct that piece. But in terms of, uh, in terms of business and that impact, I've met with, I met with the Chamber of Commerce. We actually had a, a round table. They asked me to come and talk about this proposal. I mean, what I hear from businesses is they're concerned about, uh, for example, the loss, the, lack, the loss of police officers and the impact that that's going to have on our police department's ability to patrol downtown and to be able to provide public safety. They're concerned about the, in, the loss to infrastructure. And frankly, businesses are really concerned about our education system. Uh, you know, education is, is about education, but it also has an impact on our local economy, on being a vibrant city that businesses want to locate in, uh, businesses want to grow in, they want a strong school system. And look around at many of those downtown businesses. I see Rich Cooper here. You go to up and down, uh, you know, whether it's in Florence or in downtown, uh, on Main Street, you see a lot of people that are the product of our school system that are now the business owners in our school system. They're, these are now the people that are part of our economy. So, uh, you know, this is multi-generational, and I believe that, uh, that those impacts uh, will, be, uh, will be important in terms of the impact on businesses if we don't maintain these key services. Uh, so I think there's actually an argument to be made that this is good for our economy uh, to keep a strong city uh, going and a strong uh, services that we provide, including education. Um. Since we are the Ward 3 Association, Ward 3 is our constituency, the next question I'd like to have asked by somebody from Ward 3. Is there somebody from Ward 3 who would like to ask a question? Come on, we're not a pack of shrinking violets here. <laughs> okay, Fred. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty loud. Social Security <laughs> number? <laughs> uh, Fred Zimnock, Ward 3, uh, 23 Pomeroy Terrace. Uh, the last time you spoke here, you were mayoral candidate. You said you were going to keep your eye on the budget, providing a five year budget plan satisfies that pledge for me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Looking at it from the point of view, from your point of view, I'd say you, you have some good features in there. It shows a 3.5% increase going forward, which should cut the city some slack. I look forward to your annual update to this five-year plan. But when I look down at my shoes, <clears throat> I see I'm wearing taxpayer shoes, so my view is a bit different. I noticed, for example, that during the current Great Recession, which was from 2007 onward, 
Northampton property values fluctuated up and down about four million bucks. Now you're estimating an override increase of 79 cents in the property tax rate. This would uh, require an increase of $100 million in property value. If that's not true, the 79 cent increase might really be a dollar or maybe more. Can you uh, explain your reasoning for this estimate? For a $100 million increase in the property, uh, well, the, the uh, it's not the property values. It's the seventy. It's the per thousand. Uh, the seventy nine cents. The per thousand. That's the seventy nine uh, cents. Yeah, exactly. It, it comes from the fact that you're assuming that the property values will increase a hundred million bucks in the city, and that sounds a little generous. Uh, well, we have factored in some new growth as part of our. Uh, I don't know that we're factoring. I'm not. I'm unsure where you're getting the hundred million dollar increase. I can tell you that. Uh, these numbers, we've talked to Joan Serafin, our longtime assessor, right. and had her uh, look at the numbers in terms of what we're estimating. Uh, she does all of our new growth estimates. We've also asked her what will be the impact on the you know, average tax rate uh, as best as she can estimate. We obviously have to go through the whole reval process and we have to have our tax rate certified. Uh, but I believe uh, the numbers that we're putting forward are, are accurate. I mean, it's. As you know, we've talked about this before, yeah. it's, uh, the, the values and the tax rate are constantly in, in sort of in, in a symbiotic movement. And you've got that overall tax levy, which we're held to, and then the assessors have to make all those tax rates and tax assessments stay under that levy. Um, so, you know, we are, we are raising the capacity, we are asking for the ability to raise an additional 2.5% in revenue uh, by, by being able to raise that, that uh, adding to that tax levy. Um, the 100 million, I, I guess I'd need to talk to you more about that to understand the math there. Okay, so you feel comfortable with the 79 cent increase? I feel comfortable that that represents what the 2.5 million is uh, as, as, as part of the overall calculation. Yeah, that's the, that's the number that comes straight from the assessor. Thank you. Um, hmm. and I, so did I? Does he have time left? I didn't quite. It was oh, sort no, of. 30 seconds. Okay. And I, I guess I just wanted to, uh, well, first of all, thank you in terms of your comments about my, my attention to the budget. That is something I campaigned on, and I feel like I've been uh, very uh, conservative in terms of being uh, watchful of the tax dollars. And I've, I've tried to implement savings when I can. I've made cuts when I can. Uh, and I've also uh, not been shy about uh, looking at things and saying, why are we doing it this way, and can we do it a different way and save money? So I thank you for those comments. I, the uh, $14.26 tax rate, um, on top of that, um, you add in the overrides that are running right now, which includes uh, JFK, the high school, and then whatever. And then the $600,000 worth of no, new growth, which is what we're projecting. Not necessarily going to be 600, who knows, it could be seven, it could be five. <clears throat> but the, like the JFK school will be paid off in 2016. Well, we've been paying on that for 20 years. And by the time it gets paid off, that is already added to the levy. The two and a, it's already added to the levy. So you, will you really save it? Will you really miss that when it goes away? How much, uh, how much relief are you going to get when that single override goes away? There's still three more um, that still have to go away. Uh, the uh, police station override, I, I spoke with... Uh, um, Joe Conkis today, and the, the positions that are on the chopping block are empty now. I'm not, those positions are currently unfilled, and they just won't, they won't be filled because there's a freeze. So um, I'm not, uh, and, and the, the superintendent also told us at the June 11th budget hearing that even if the override passes, he's not restoring any teaching positions. Now, so I, I, so it, 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 that was really struck me as odd. And I, we asked again, it was asked twice. The question was asked twice at the college because we didn't think we heard it correctly. And he said, even if the override passes, they're not restoring any teaching positions. What they will do is they will restore some school supplies. That's what he told us. Here he is. Thank you. <laughs> the superintendent's thank, here. Yeah, thank you. I saw you sitting there. No, please, please. You got one minute. Uh, I'll use 
Take two. Take two. Why don't you come here, turn, turn, and face the audience? Please. <laughs> Just trying to clarify the point uh, that with the override, we're restoring many of the teaching positions. We're not able to restore all of the teaching positions. But we will be bringing back elective classes to the high school and to the middle school, restoring positions at the elementary. We will be funding the schools for school supplies, textbooks, and materials. And we will be looking to restore the busing to the high school. So I just wanted to clarify that point. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, um, another question. Um, I saw a woman with a white, yeah. Get, na name and name and address. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you, why don't you come up and try this mic? Will this, will this mic carry? This one right here. Um, it's best to use that one. Okay. Name, do a name and address again. Uh, Brenda Sprague Kent, uh, Ward 7, Florence. Uh, I have a question about what Brian just said. Is he really didn't clarify it said that much from my point of view. If you're not going to restore all the classes, all the teachers, which ones are you not going to? Because that's important to me. If I'm going to vote for this, because I want to make sure that we have our kids have the best education, even though mine's already graduated, it's important to me to know what are you going to cut? Are you cutting uh, R? Are you going to cut band? Do you mind if the superintendent? No, this is fine. Do you mind if the superintendent? This is fine. I'd like an answer. I think we'd all like an answer to that. Superintendent, do you want to do you want to take that one for? No, no. We'll, we'll give you two minutes to. And can I just ask? What, I'm just going to make one other comment, and then I'm going to sit down. My other comment is to um, anyone who's interested in being proactive. Why does Smith College get away with not participating monetarily in any responsibility towards our educational programs? in this city, when many universities throughout the whole country, including Harvard and BC and BU, I mean, they all contribute in the pilot program to help fund education. A lot of the kids that graduate from North Hampton go on to very elite colleges because and Smith mm -hmm. gets a lot of benefits from our tax dollars, from our businesses downtown, and I and from the police department, from the fire department, and I think that they should pay. <laughs> Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you. Superintendent, and then well, I'm going to let the two speakers answer the second part of her question after okay. you're done. I'll be brief. So let me just explain the process. You, you, you uh, take that second. I had to question. propose a budget, a balanced budget, and that was voted back in April. And from that budget, we cut uh, a number of positions. Um, so that's, that's already done. Those people have been, you know, sections have been cut from the uh, classes. They've been able to sign up for it. Those people have been spoken to. Those parts of their positions have been laid off. What happens with an override is that if you vote to bring some money back to the schools, what I will do is make a proposal to the school committee of what I think we should bring back. On that proposal, as I just described, our teaching positions for the middle school, for the high school, and elective positions. I really don't want to go through 0.17 in music and 0.3 in that. That's, that's not for this discussion. Um, but that is part of my proposal to the school committee, along with the busing and some new programs to help support special education as well as to support English language learners. If the override passes, my team of administrators put the proposal together that I will submit to the school committee, and the school committee votes whether to put that in place or not. Counselor, you want to take the second part of her question and response? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we all remember the Green Street neighborhoods uh, being torn down and being raised. And the property value, the tax that, the college, that was being paid at the time by the property owners was going to be picked up by Smith College as a pilot. Well, they, they did. But in the bottom of the agreement, it said if there was any affordable housing that was built anywhere else in the city, then that assessed value would be forgiven. 
on the other property. So actually the property values, the tax, I think were about 67 or some odd thousand dollars of the property that was torn down. So they would pay a $67,000 in a pilot. But there's $47,000 that they get worth of abatements for other stuff that they have, so it brought it down to $21,000. So it was, I, I don't think it was a very good deal. I don't think they did us well in this negotiation on that. And it's a good question. The city of Northampton, the downtown, is every bit a part of the Smith College campus as Smith College proper is. And I do think they should pay more. Uh, yes, uh, there is a, uh, well, there, we, we do have pilot agreements with Smith College. This was the limited one under the development agreement, which I've uh, inherited and have tried to enforce. We will be obviously adding to that now that another building has been taken down um, uh, in that neighborhood. Uh, we also received pilots from, uh, and that's payment in lieu of taxes for people who don't understand what a pilot is. Um, uh, we also received uh, them from the Northampton Housing Authority and a smaller one uh, for um, a development on city property, the Solomon Schechter School. Uh, we also, as part of our recent RFP process, uh, Councillor Tacey and I worked on uh, for the Florence Community Center, we were gonna require a pilot on that. I do believe, and I've heard from a lot of people about this issue of a broader pilot conversation with Smith College. I agree with that. I've been actually have had meetings with various uh, groups, including parent groups, and that is one of those areas of new revenue that we have to explore going forward. Um, Smith is in the middle of a change of administration right now, um, and I believe that when that change happens, that is one of the things that will be on my agenda to talk with them about. Um, but uh, just like we're trying to look for other sources of new revenue at the state level, just like we're supporting a progressive income tax, uh, just like we're trying to look for new uh, local options for us to be able to raise revenue, they aren't going to help us on July 1st. Uh, we have to, these are the, these cuts uh, that are part of the budget before us will go into effect on July 1st. So I pledge to you that I'm going to continue to work, and that's part of the reason with this four-year plan, uh, that I'm going to continue to work to make that plan last longer. I want it to last longer than four years because I'm going to be out there looking for new revenue. And I've already been lobbying legislators, uh, lobbying uh, for uh, provisions in the current budget that could help Northampton, including formula changes around Chapter 70. Um, I'm going to try to make that last longer. Uh, but for right now, in the next uh, less than a week, the question before us is what are we going to do to preserve the services we have? And the only option we have for creating revenue for July 1st is this uh, Proposition 2.5 override. Okay. Um, in, in the back, do you want to come up to the microphone so they can, can hear you? if the override doesn't pass. And I'm curious, what happens 2015, 16, and 17 if the override does not pass? Is, has that been mapped out? What kind of cuts are we facing? It's you first. Oh, it's me first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, uh, you know, one of the things that, one of the issues that's going to happen is we're going to make these cuts uh, right now. Uh, the, the cuts that are part of my budget and obviously part of the school budget that the superintendent described, um, which means we're going to see that reduction in services. And essentially, we're, uh, we'll be then coming through the next fiscal year, um, you know, looking at projections for state aid. We saw a mild increase in state aid this year. Um, again, that's against a backdrop of losing, uh, you know, over the last, well, if you want to go back 10 or 15 years, you know, they've left about 35 million that we could have had if they had just level funded us. But in the last four years, we've lost over a million dollars in state aid. Um, I don't see that picture improving. Um, we are obviously working very hard to expand our tax base to create new growth and, and, and create new local revenue that way. Um, but I believe that we'll be back having this conversation again uh, with the already reduced services. And that's one of the things that I think people have to understand. In the FY13 budget, my first budget, we made significant cuts. Uh, we had, you know, we had a major spike in our health insurance costs that required us to make service cuts in order to, to, to balance that budget. So we've already, we already made cuts this year, including layoffs uh, in the city, uh, positions being eliminated in the city and the schools. Um, so we're already starting from that position as we come into 14, and it just becomes a, it becomes a, a spiral effect from there. So 
my hope is to provide the sustainability over the next few years uh, to allow us to maintain level services. The, uh, when the, was, when the uh, two and a half was proposed this time, I, in previous years before a budget or an override was proposed, the department heads were asked to submit budgets that were either le level funded or with a 1% cut or 2% or 5%. I didn't see that this time. It was just, boom, we need an override. I think there's probably some creativity in the department heads that they might have been able to come up with something uh, somewhere, but we could have at least tried it. The, so I don't believe that the override is the only way to balance this budget. I have come up with quite a few different things that I've discussed with the mayor. I talked with the Department of Revenue today uh, for quite a while with the Chief Legal Counsel, Don Gorton, and I talked about the ballot question saying that how about if we can exempt people as we exempt people from the CPA, those of small means, those that can't afford this override, if they could be exempted from this, heck, I'd be ready, I'd, I'd be on board, but they can't be exempted unless we have a home rule petition with the city council in Northampton and we hand that off to Stanley Rosenberg and he takes it to Boston and according to the chief legal counsel of the Department of Revenue, they look very favorable upon these type of, of exemptions. And so if we had known that something like this was coming, we probably could have crafted this question differently and we probably could have tried to exempt many. The, the, I'd like to get in, I know I haven't got much time, but the exemptions from the city that we have are quite lame. Uh, if you, I, I've got them here with, with what is required. Uh, and most of the seniors and, and the disabled right now are already getting these exemptions. We also have an exemption for uh, Purple Heart recipients and things such as that. Um, but I think we could have spent a little bit more time on this before we jumped right into the override uh, mode. And I don't think we did. I think there could have been some more thought or some more procedure or policy put in place. Okay. Um, anybody from Ward 3 got their hand up? Jeff? 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 All right. I'm Jeff Wilber, 35 Group. I think this will come up again, I hope tonight. Cuts to our police. We don't need a repeat of the drunken brawl that happened over the last weekend. What happens if this gets out of hand, the quality of life in the state will be down here. But my main concern gets back to the school here. We have a very vibrant aquatic and family center that's doing a lot of good both here and people around town. If we start shutting it down on weekends, we're not going to have that much longer. I think I would like to address, is there any alternative that, that the rec department can come up with? I would like to address this to Mayor Aquas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Councilor yeah. Tacey gets the question the first. Aquatic, that's in my ward. I, I, spoke with, I, I spoke with Anne Marie Mojo today, and uh, she is doing everything she can at this point to see how she can keep that, that funded. Um, I don't know just exactly how it's going to come out, and I can't speak for her because I don't know. But I do know that it is on the front burner. Mm -hmm. It is on the front burner to preserve that, uh, the time uh, that it is open. And I, I can't say any more than that about it. But it's a great facility. I supported that override. Um, and I, I can't say any more about it because I can't speak for Anne-Marie Mojo or the Recreation Department. I have been working uh, with, with the rec department. We obviously, that is an important priority for us. And part of that's a, a, a function of the fact that the school department is cutting a custodian that's a weekend custodian. Um, so I have uh, made a commitment that if, if that we're going to uh, try to bring that position over to the city side uh, if the override passes so that we can maintain that position going forward, that it's not always uh, running up against the school budget cuts. Mm -hmm. I did want to address a couple of other things. You mentioned police. Um, and something was said earlier about how there's a freeze right now on hiring those four new officers. Well, the reason why we're doing that is because if we hire them and then lay them off on July 1st, we'll be paying unemployment. So this close to the end of the budget year, uh, the chief is not filling those positions. Uh, there's been a retirement. There's been some other uh, f uh, movement to other uh, departments. So he's freezing those because his budget says that he has to have four less police officers. That's the reason why he's freezing them. Um, 
the state exemptions, there, there's really no way you could add a debt exclusion. I mean, a, you can't combine a debt exclusion question with a home rule petition in one question. It's just that's not feasible. And I guess I'd have to learn more about this, uh, about this, uh, uh, what the Department of Revenue has told us, because I'd be surprised that that, that, uh, that would get a lot of support, because I think there'd be 350 other communities lining up outside the door for the same exact legislation. And then finally, I would say um, one other correction was just the idea of the debt exclusion projects, the four debt exclusion uh, projects that we have. Those projects aren't, actually aren't, uh, aren't added into the levy. They, they, those are sort of, after we do the calculation, we pay those off. We're allowed to raise revenue to pay the debt service on those projects. But if you look at the chart, um, that's above and beyond the base levy. The base levy doesn't include those projects, and they actually get smaller every year until they go away. So I just wanted to also correct that, um, that piece of information as well. Oh, yellow. concerned about this override passing. I'm concerned about the future. In the past, the overrides that I've been in favor of and that have been presented to us have been for capital projects. This is just a generic override. What happens, you know, so this is a 79 cent increase. What happens in the next year when we need a new water and sewer treatment plant? What happens when we need a new Department of Public Works building? You know, these are going to be capital projects that we know are in the forefront of our community and that we need. My concern as a taxpayer, and as a homeowner, and as I am a teacher, is, is this just going to keep happening year after year after year? It feels to me like a slippery slope, and that's my concern. Not this year, but what happens down the road? That's my question. Am I the... Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> so again... Uh, part of what I've tried to do here is show how we can uh, build, have a plan that's sustainable uh, to be able to provide those level services going forward. We're also making investments in another area that I talked a lot about uh, during my budget presentations, which is our reserve funds, because our reserve funds have grown woefully low over time. Uh, our bond rating agencies have warned us that we're going to have our bond rating downgraded, which is going to affect our borrowing rates. So we're trying to build in for some of those capital needs as well into this, uh, make some um, investments there. And there's actually a capital plan in my budget where we've tried to make some capital investments. Obviously, we have a lot of large infrastructure needs, that's for sure. There's a discussion going on about st our stormwater uh, needs. The Corps of Engineers was here a couple of weeks ago that the Ward 3 sponsored, talking about the very real issues with our aging levy system. Uh, we have to make those kinds of capital investments. And that's always the tension. It's the same kind of tension we have in our own homes. I just, I just actually installed a new furnace in my home. Uh, my 30-year-old furnace uh, decided to retire. And so uh, we had to make that capital investment. Um, but we have to make that investment. But we also still have to have our day-to-day -day operating budget. So that, that is always the tension. Um, but again, we're going to continue to try to work on those projects on a long-term basis. And yes, they will cost us some money. Um, and we, uh, but I also would assert that we also have to keep our eye on the day-to-day -day services that we have to provide, the public safety, the, the education, all the other core services. That's another important function that we have to, and that's part of the, the balancing act that we have to do as a city, looking both long-term as well as the here and now, the short-term. The... Uh just the, the base levy right now uh, for your, your tax rate is fourteen dollars and twenty six cents. With the ad, with the overrides added together, and this new override, it brings it up to fifteen dollars and fifty nine cents, which is about four hundred dollars on a three hundred thousand dollar home. As far as the uh, facilities, the H two uh, the water and sewer rates, the chairman of the board of public works told us last year that. Water and sewer rates were going to rise by somewhere around 10% every year for the foreseeable future. Now that the override is proposed, water and sewer rates, I think to soften the blow, only went up 2.5% this year. So what happens next year? They're going to go back up to 10%. Maybe they'll go up to 15 to cover the 5% they lost this year. I don't know. But you can rest assured that they will go back up your 9 or 10%. The, we don't even know what the, uh, the stormwater enterprise fund is going to cost each. Uh, I've heard 
estimates anywhere from $65 to $320. That hasn't even been finalized yet. So you add all of this together, this is a huge burden. This is tremendous anguish on a lot of people that can't, that don't have the funds, that are of limited means. Um, the gentleman in the black, or dark sweater, you? Yeah. Blue. Blue. It's a blue sweater. Want to come up to the microphone? Paul? No, I, this fellow. Yeah. Sorry. My name is Helen Hell Boss. I live on Ward Street. I'm 84 years old. I voted in every election since I was 21. And for the first time in my life, I'm thinking of voting no. And the reason is because my land, I'm, I'm, I'm a renter. My landlord recently told me that if the override passes, he's going to be forced to raise rent. If he raises rent, I'm going to be forced to move. And of course, there's no place to move in Northampton where I would be able to escape the increase in taxes. The second reason is because... Hill, Hill, this is the part of the... where you ask questions of these two people. Okay. Okay, so do you have a question for them? Yes, I do. Okay, let's have the questions. Okay, my question, Jerry, is, is this, if I could frame it, and I could frame it in, in a question. Um, it's based on my experience as a school teacher for 32 years. There were many budgets that were defeated in my school district in New York State. And yet, the quality of the education did not, was not reduced. Mm -hmm. My question is this. Isn't there a way how the school committee and the mayor's office could face a defeat of the override and still allow enough money to be found, such as in a hotel motel tax, mm -hmm. that will replace the money that's lost because of the override. Thank you. Gene, I think you're first. Yeah, I, the, the mayor's budget is the mayor's budget. It's how he proposes the budget. Um, we, we get the hotel and motel tip, but we don't get it all. It goes to the state, we get some back. Um, we'd like to have it all, but the formula does not allow for it. Uh, parking receipts reserved for, for appropriation. That is money that can be utilized for any lawful municipal expense. And it all depends on where the mayor wants to put that money. Same with uh, ambulance. Even Thomas Scanlon one day said, even your, uh, your overlay surplus account can be used as free cash. But you have to be careful where you, we have to be careful where you take that money from because there are things that we have to fund with things like overlay surplus, like exemptions and abatements and things that we have to cover at the end of the year. Um, uh, parking, uh, receipts. I, the, a mayor and two city solicitors and a couple of department heads all told me for years that you could not use that money for anywhere except for parking related purposes and I didn't believe them and I went to the Department of Revenue and I came back with a letter that says parking receipts reserved for appropriation can be used for any lawful municipal expense. The same with ambulance receipts reserved for appropriation. They can all be used for any lawful municipal expense. One of the, the drawbacks on the ambulance one is when the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court found that evergreen clauses were illegal, that was their ruling. Governor Deval Patrick immediately thereafter signed a bill into law that made evergreen clauses legal and retroactive. So 
it tied the hands of every municipal uh, municipality in the city for collective bargaining. There is no reason for somebody that has a contract that was written in 2007 to even come to the bargaining table because it was a gravy contract, and now we hear 2008, we crash, all of our money falls apart, our, our, our return on investment goes from 600000 down to 100000 and we can't negotiate effectively because of the evergreen clauses. So it's difficult. It's, 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 it's very, very tough to... to um, I'll stop because I got the sign. So I think the original question was, relate, uh, was about the school budget in particular, and I, I'm obviously I'm right there because I'm the chair of the school committee. That's one of my duties, and I've been very uh, intimately involved in that whole discussion. And again, last year, I'm having to make difficult cuts last year. Um, again, these are real cuts. Uh, this is, these are cuts that, uh, you know, I think as the superintendent described, teachers have already been told uh, that this budget will force their positions to go away. Um, and, and the impacts will be real. And uh, again, we, for years, uh, we've, uh, the school committee uh, has been trying to buffer, keep classrooms, keep these cuts away from classrooms. So we've had, you know, we have these uh, supply budgets of like, you know, $100 for an entire school like this school, because we've been cutting those things, trying to preserve teach, uh, teaching positions. So teachers have been buying most of the supplies themselves uh, to be able to provide them for the classrooms or PTOs. Uh, and so we're now at a point, though, where we, there's no other places to cut except classrooms, and that's what you're seeing now. And so at schools like Ridge Street, at JFK, at the high school, we're going to see classes uh, be eliminated. Um, you know, the other issue is the, the parking, the receipt reserve for parking appropriation. Um, you know, we are using that for other than parking expenses. Ten of our police officers are funded with parking revenue out of this budget. We're funding DPW. Uh, that does work in our downtown. Uh, we're paying off the debt service on the parking garage portion of the police station with that revenue. So that revenue is being put to use for uh, very vital city services. So um, it's, we can't spend it twice. We're, we are spending it now on these other city services. Um, so that's important to know. And then just talking about our tax rate, because I know I've heard a lot, particularly the Gazette wrote a, a rather puzzling story yesterday about somehow we had the highest tax rate on the planet. I mean, the average tax rate on a single family tax bill in Massachusetts is a little under 5,000. Northampton, it's about 4,200. We're below the state average. We're middle of the pack in the valley. Uh, we don't have the highest tax rate um, around. So I also think it's important that we talk about facts and we talk about the reality. Yes, this will be an increase in taxes, um, but again, it's to pay for, I believe, important services. And, and one other thing, I did meet with all my department heads. They were told to submit level-funded budgets. That's how we began this process. And many of them have ha then had to go back and cut their budgets as a result of the, the gap that we're facing. Um, the green? Uh, my name's Garson Fields. I live in, uh, in Ward 7. Uh, and I have a, a question uh, as to why Stan Rosenberg and, and uh, Peter Kokot aren't here. Uh, are they both alive? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, to me, it's really uh, it's a travesty that those two guys aren't here to participate in this conversation because they're both integral to the relationship between this town and Boston. So. Okay. All right, next question. No, no, next question. Um, well, that's not an irre a relevant question to our discussion. I don't know why he's not here. Somebody call him and ask him. I don't know why he's not here. Call him. All right. You want to answer? Uh, well, I, I, I do know that the House and Senate are debating the budget this week, so I know that they, are, they do have votes in, in, in Boston, so uh, presumably that's where they are today. Um, you know, and that is, I mean, 
uh, first of all, I want to say that both Senator Rosenberg and, and Representative Cocott uh, work very hard for the city of Northampton, have helped us with a number of different projects. There is a larger structural issue that we're facing in terms of our state budgets, in terms of our tax system, frankly. Uh, you know, we don't have a progressive tax system in Massachusetts. Many of us have been fighting for that, lobbying for that, um, so that people at the higher end of the income scale would pay more in taxes, which would then give us more revenue that we need, which could then come back to cities and towns. And again, piggybacking on something that Councillor Tacey said, in my budget message, I point out the fact that, you know, if the state would just let us keep the money that we're generating here, I mean, our, down, our restaurants are generating on the order of 25 to $30 million a year in tax revenue for the state. You know, we get to keep about 700,000 of it, um, the rest of it goes to the state, and then it gets recycled back to us in these various formulas, uh, which don't always uh, uh, do well. Northampton doesn't always do well under them. So, you know, my message to them is if, you know, we've taken every local option you've given us, if you're not going to give us anything more, give us local authority to raise revenue in a way that's not a property tax, which is not the best way to raise revenue. It's not, it's somewhat regressive. But give us other options for raising revenue. Um, and let us run our cities and our communities the way we want. Um, so that's my message, and I'm going to continue to lobby for more local authority so that we can control our own destiny. That's the one good thing about this. At least we get to control our own destiny with the override. This is our money. We're paying it. It stays in Northampton, and we get to budget it the way we want to budget it. <coughs> of course, just a couple little tidbits. The money that seems to leave Northampton does not come back. It pays for things such as... The MTA has generated such a debt service, it costs twice as much to pay their debt service as it does to cover their entire personal service. When was the last time anybody here rode the subway? The largest public works project that's ever happened in the country happened in Boston. When was the last time you guys went through the tunnel to get to Logan Airport? I go to Hartford, it's closer. So if, if we handled our money in the city of Northampton as poorly as the state has handled it, they would have taken us over. They took over Springfield. They moved right in. I mean, why don't we take over the state? I mean, I can't, we, we need to lobby the state. We need to lobby these guys hard. And not just, you don't just say, hey, you're doing a great job. I'm a big supporter of yours to start the conversation off and then laugh and rub elbows all the way through the meeting. Tell them what the hell you want. Tell them what they're doing. Tell them you need this. If everybody in this room went and knocked on Peter Colcott's door on Sunday morning at 7 o'clock and said, hey, what the heck are you doing down there? Or you've got, we have people in Congress for 37 years. That's, why, that, that's part of the problem. They're dysfunctional. Um, fellow with the beard there? You. Yeah. You. Hello, uh, Ronnie Gold, Ward 3, uh, Linden Street. And um, I'm also a uh, parent, so I have two children, so obviously the um, young children, obviously what's going on with the schools is very relevant to me. I'm also a public elementary school teacher for the last 10 years on my school leadership team, so I'm aware a little bit about what the mayor was saying about the numbers of whether it's 1.8 or 2.5, and which makes me realize that there's a lot still, in, as you mentioned, uh, the mayor mentioned that it went up to 18 and down to put like the numbers are still in flux. Um, my question is, was it considered to wait and see what happens? Because we could do an override next year. As far, I'm not involved in politics, but my understanding is we could ask for it next year. And could we wait and see what the impact would be of these cuts? Because we're literally talking about 10 months to students, and then it might get more support from the community, maybe be less divisive, and also, along those lines, um, have we considered the other investments we need in our schools? Because we obviously need to not only just maintain the status quo, but improve in what we have in terms of technology, in terms of the number of students to teacher ratios, the types of courses that we're offering. And so how does a battle over this small increase affect possibilities for actu actual necessary investments to prepare our children for the future. Okay. Well, first off, um, I, as far as the, the courses and things, I have the 
course catalog from Hinton High School. We teach, it, it takes two years of a foreign language to graduate high school. That's the requirement. We teach five years of, of Spanish and French, and we teach four years of Latin. Those courses are taught also at Smith, in every university, in every, every community college. They're also, people, kids in high school can pe actually pick those up, I think, at Smith for free, at no charge. That's higher education, and we're teaching it in the Northampton High School. If, rather than cut art and music, a very small percentage of the kids need art and music, but they're still real numbers. A lot of kids don't ordinarily do well in academics, but they do very well in art and music. They excel. So if you're going to continue to teach third, fourth, and fifth year language courses and cut out art and music, you have disenfranchised a whole bunch of kids. And the ones that do well in academics, that are taking the f third, fourth, and fifth year language courses, they're going to do well in academics no matter where they are, where they go. But you can't disenfranchise this group of kids that will excel in art and music and not necessarily in uh, in academics. So maybe cut those language courses. I don't expect a kid to graduate from high school and be fluent in French or Spanish. I don't expect it. I didn't expect it when I went through high school. But if you can cut that and restore art, music, and physical education for kids in elementary school, cut it. They can take these courses in college. In small class sizes, I'm, that's a good idea. But don't forget, they leave the senior in high school and they get into a lecture hall of 300 people. Have you prepared them for that? Thank you. Uh, uh, so in terms of your concept of waiting to see what happens, I mean, I think the concern, obviously, that we hear from the administrators, from the superintendent, as the, is the cuts that are being proposed this year are of a very severe nature that, and again, we're, you're saying let's wait and see what happens at the state level, political level, but what happens to those children that are in the school this year um, that are, that, you know, that's going to impact their education, not just that year, but going forward. So those are choices that, that uh, you know, I don't want to be faced with, that's, which is why we're asking the community for its support. Um, we are classrooms. Uh, we are trying to make investments in technology. Um, I talked earlier about my capital plan. We have made investments last year, and this budget proposes to make investments in increasing the technology or, or bringing it up to date, the technology in our schools, because we know that for 21st century learners, that's a key part of, uh, of preparing them. Um, you know, in terms of talking about eliminating two sections of Spanish, that's not going to restore all the classes that have just been ticked off for you. And I'm glad that the cha vice chair of the school committee is not here tonight, um, Ed Zahowski, um, who's also a Spanish teacher. I think he would have a different view <laughs> of the value of, uh, of language and foreign language as part of a well-rounded education, again, in preparing children to be not only citizens of Northampton, but citizens of the nation and of the world. Um, and, and again, I, I think that uh, 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 that would just be my position on that. I think it's a little overstated that you can eliminate uh, uh, sections of foreign language and we're going to be able to restore everything. It's really not a one for one. Well, I'm going to oh. attempt a little multitasking. I was in public housing. How does this override affect us in public housing? Well, yeah. Am I the first to start? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So the Northampton Housing Authority. Um, uh, despite the being called Northampton Housing Authority, is not funded by the city budget. It's a state agency. It's funded through the state. Um, and so uh, other than, uh, you know, I do have some appointees to a board that oversees it. Um, we don't provide funding to it. They are facing cuts right now as part of uh, s uh, federal sequestration cuts that are coming down the line. Um, and uh, so there have been cuts to programs like the Section 8 program and um, some of their other budgets uh, that are going to have impacts where you live, but it's not a direct result of these cuts in the city budget. Um, so that's the, the quick answer to that. Yeah. I, I just have to agree with that. The, uh, it, is, it is state, but th their money comes from the feds, and it just comes through the state, and um, this override has really no impact on that whatsoever. Um, gentleman in a purple yes. um, I have a long-term question and a very short question. 
Well, hopefully you can state them quickly. Yeah, the, the long-term ones for you or anybody else here, I think that we You are. Any yeah, any your name and address. Or any girl seven will apply to the long-term looking at the teacher. I've asked people for over 25 years to tell me, what is the determination for the state formula? And no one seems to be able to really break that down. So if one of you or someone in the audience could do that for us, that would be great, okay? The shorter one is, if the override fails and busing is completely canceled for the high school, what would be the plan to deliver and bring the scores of young men and women in this town at the high school to get to the high school to come to class when they live three to seven miles away in the meadows, leaves, et cetera? Okay. Uh, you're yeah. You're first. How are you going to get them to the classes? Don't worry about cutting classes. How are you going to get the kids to the classes? I think uh, everybody at the council knows that I've always been hammering on the formula, and I want to know just exactly what the formula is and how it's determined. And I know it's not determined in Northampton. I know it's not determined in Western Massachusetts at all. You seem to be left out in the cold at a lot of things. As far as busing goes, one of the basics of education, I think, is getting kids to the school. That is one of the basics of education, is to get kids to the school. Uh, and it's frustrating for me to watch the buses at the high school come in empty and go away with one or two kids in them. It's frustrating as heck. But the parking lot is full. They're all riding. My son, since he got his license, there's four kids in that car every morning and afternoon. Um, so I, Ernie, I, I, Mr. Brill, I don't have an answer um, for the transportation part of it. Uh, I know it's frustrating for the officials that are actually involved in the transportation. They wonder, maybe smaller buses, then all of a sudden. But the state says you have to have a seat for every kid with a free and reduced pass. I know that. Um, and I don't know exactly how it works uh, with the busing. Uh, maybe the superintendent, I'd like to ask him if you could. I know I, I don't want you to take over the meeting, but I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask you about the busing part of it. Do you want him to answer or do you want to take it? Um, I, I was going to address the larger concern about the loss of high school busing. Um, you know, if, if you want to be Joy Winnie and explain how the how the intricacies of that works, go, you can do that part of it. I'll right, give you a minute, because there was a minute left on Councillor Tacey's time. Thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so for the, to answer the question about the busing, if a student on free or reduced lunch wants a bus pass and is going to ride the bus, then we have to have a seat for them. But if they don't want to ride the bus, we don't have to hold an empty seat for them. And just to clarify, for the, the buses coming to the high school empty and leaving with one or two kids on it, actually we have 242 kids, high school kids, who take the buses to, to and from school. It's not every day, because some kids stay for sports, they stay for clubs, but there are 242 kids who ask for a pass who need to take the bus to and from school. So I was going to, just to piggyback on it, I have to also clarify that Kids pay for bus passes, so I, I, and that's one of the other things that we've had to do as part of uh, our budget cuts over time. We now charge families for, for passes to ride the bus, so I have to buy a pass for my two kids uh, to ride the bus to school. I think the loss of high school busing, uh, the fact that I think Northampton would be probably one of the only districts in Western Mass that would literally would be eliminating school busing for one of its levels of school, I think we would be the only one doing that. That's a, that, I think, tells you the, the dramatic nature of what we're facing here. And I have great concerns about it because we do have many families who don't have, whose both parents are working, have to get out to their jobs in the morning, uh, may, may not have the means to get their kids to school. And we know, the research shows, that kids are not going to learn if they're not in school. So that's one of the concerns I have about the, about the, about the, about the loss of busing. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's probably not going to get me a PhD for that conclusion, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's important. And, and, and when we think, look at things like uh, tardy rates and things like that, if kids are having a hard, if we don't provide them with public transportation to school, that's a pretty major thing. Um, the Chapter 70 formula, where do I begin? So, uh, so the state, the long and short of it was the state got sued uh, 
and in 1993, uh, Governor Weld, uh, facing re-election, uh, decided that they needed to come up with this formula that could try to comply with, uh, with this uh, mandate that all schools are being funded equally. The bad part about it is they took a lot of metrics about property values, they took a lot of metrics about um, you know, uh, median income, all those kinds of things, and then they took the way communities spent their money and they basically froze it in time in 1993 and they basically baked that into the formula. So here's a crazy thing. So if you were a community in 1993 that paid for uh, retired teacher health care out of your school budget, you got credit for that as part of what you were spending on education. If you paid for it out of your city budget, you didn't get credit for it towards education spending because where it was like how you did the accounting in 1993, that got baked into your formula going forward. So there's a whole set of communities um, who get treated differently under the formula. That's one example. There's actually reform, there's a bill to reform that. I've been lobbying, I've actually gone to Beacon Hill, I've met with four of the six uh, budget conferees to really lobby for that provision. That's the kind of progress we need on Chapter 70 because they created this formula you know, 20, 30 years ago. It doesn't, A, it doesn't represent, it's a snapshot in time then. It also doesn't take into account all of the new mandates that we now have unfunded mandates that we cities and towns have to pay for. Everything from MCAS, uh, this new, all the new teacher evaluations, all these other things that we're now required to do, but we don't get money for them. And so that's the problem with these chapter 70 formulas and other formulas uh, that really don't, haven't kept place with inflation. I'm stomping. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, oh, Paul, okay, Paul, you wanna? Paul Walker, 52 Kilrain Terrace. I uh, feel very strongly that there's a uh, considerable amount of waste in our city. I think that's why a lot of people are here this evening wasting money in the city budget. I don't understand why we wait a whole year to have a crisis meeting about an override. In the corporate world, and I spent 18 years there, you manage your corporate sales and everything based upon your budget. <coughs> if in the first month you're not meeting your goals, you lay off people, you make some changes. We just spend, 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 come out at the end of the year with a budget that's two and a half million dollars in a hole, and say, everybody's got to cough up. I can't go to my neighbor and say, hey, give me some money. Paul, what's, your, what's the question you want to address to them? What's the question? I have one minute. The question is, can we not change the process of spending in relationship to our income? So uh, again, that's a, that's a Interesting question. Let me just say that many of the many of the expenses that we're talking about this year, these fixed expenses that are going up, they're not things that are optional. We, they're, for example, one of the largest, oddly enough, I think uh, Councilor was talking about the overlay uh, uh, surplus fund. We have to pay. We have to cover a deficit because the appellate tax board uh, basically gave uh, ruled in favor of Verizon across the whole Commonwealth that they were being overtaxed on their utilities. So one of the largest things we're paying for is an abatement to Verizon. No option there. Uh, we have to pay for that. Um, we have to pay to make contributions to our retirement system to pay for retired uh, uh, employees. That's mandatory. That's an independent system. We have to meet that. Um, it was actually going to be higher, but the retirement board thankfully uh, was willing to change their projections to allow it to not be as severe. Um, and then we have things like health insurance, which go up uh, every year, again, uh, controlled by outside forces. We've tried to make uh, changes to how we're doing that so that we can contain those costs. I think that's the piece. I mean, I can assure you, I go to work every day very concerned that we don't waste a dollar of your tax dollars. And I've done everything from, I approve every, every bit of spending over $250, I approve it personally. It comes through my office. So I look at all of that. Uh, we've done everything from combined departments. Uh, we've implemented policies for cell phones to find out who's got cell phones, do they need them, and I've taken away many of them. 
We're doing the same thing with cars. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we can find efficiencies. I'm doing a new program called CityStat, which is a performance management system. We got a grant to do it. Uh, Baltimore was one of the founders of this. It's become kind of a new wave in city government where I'm meeting with my managers on a monthly basis and we're looking at how they're delivering their services, how they're spending their monies, and we're collecting data on that so that we can make good decisions. So um, I, I often hear this, it's waste, it's waste. Really, I, I, I please trust me that this is a structural problem. Um, and again, I, I'm, I do not, we're, we're talking about how do we just pay for the services that we're providing now in this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're talking about, not adding all kinds of new things. It's just we have a we have a revenue issue. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. <clears throat> well, the uh, a lot of things the wasteful wasteful spending. I this is where I get in trouble, uh, where I always seem to stand alone. Uh, when we had the city council had approved eight hundred thousand dollars for a DPW design for a new facility. It was for an eight to ten million dollar facility. I voted against it. I said at the time. If you approve this money, you'll be just may as well take that money and throw it right in a ditch. Well, anyway, that at this point is what has happened. We spent the $800,000 on design. We designed half a facility. We designed the approval was for an eight to $10 million facility. When they came to us at the finance committee in a 40 minute meeting, this was a previous mayor. It went from eight to $10 million to $27 million. And we hadn't even designed the whole facility yet because we still had half a facility to design. So anyway, now here we are. We don't have the money to build the facility. We've already passed an override for the police station. We have a $30 million or $28 million facility that is looming right now for the DPW. We have to pay $235,000 off out of our general fund and water enterprise and sewer enterprise money. Half of it comes, I believe, from the general fund. The other half comes from water and sewer enterprise. We have to pay the entire $800,000 off in three years. So this is a very real situation. Somewhere along the line, this DPW facility is going to come up, and it's going to be either an override or it's going to be, I don't know what it's going to be, but something. To be, but the mayor has wisely put that on the back burner. And said, no, it wasn't his administration when the $800,000 came up. But if we paid attention, I think then we would not have brought up a DPW facility and a police station at the exact same time. But we did, and it, it bit us. It bit us. Time for one last question. Um, gentlemen, they were holding up the paper. Again, that you're talking about this is the 2012 audit report. Okay, um, it showed from 2011 to 2012 a four million seven hundred eighty-eight thousand dollar negative between the two years. Uh, meaning a decrease or a well, decrease? Well, the deep, well in 2011 it was twenty-five million seven hundred thousand. For 2012 it was thirty million five hundred fifty-eight thousand. So that's four million seven hundred eighty-eight thousand. Okay, it's very difficult uh, for me t without having that, you know. To understand the context of that, I can tell you that obviously employee health insurance is one of our largest, has been one of our largest budget drivers. Uh, you know, we're now spending in excess of $10 million on that one line item alone uh, because of the rising cost of health insurance. Uh, that is one of the reasons why I, I've brought forward this proposal to move us into the GIC health plan. They've been able to keep their rates much lower um, because of the buying power of all of the state employees that are in that system. Um, so 
I, I, I guess I'd have to talk to you afterwards about that uh, particular audit to understand what it's actually saying. Because sometimes those audits can be confusing when they're showing revenues coming in and out of different departments um, and on, on top and on the bottom. So I'd have to understand that. I don't believe we have a deficit, that's for sure. You'd hear about it if we had a $4 million deficit. But suffice it to say, health insurance has been one of our I large. Think it wasn't a deficit, it was just a cost. $4 million more. 2012 was just a cost. And that's probably exactly true because that, that has been going up every year. And in, tw and in 2013, our health insurance costs went up another $700. Uh, and eighty thousand dollars, which forced us to make cuts. This year, because of moving into the GIC, our increase is only going to be 0.79 percent. Um, that's going to be our health care increase this year. So that's significant, and I hope we can keep that going forward. And let me just say, I love uh, Jake's because uh, mm -hmm. I know your son is one of the one of the new operators of Jake's, and I want to thank them for making that investment in in downtown, and they have a great restaurant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that the the city has been. Pretty creative and, and diligent in addressing uh, the healthcare costs see, through different plan design changes. You know, different co-pays, and uh, but then it got to a point where there was nothing else you could do. You can only raise a co-pay so much, and it got to either you're going to go to 75-25 from the 80-20 that we're at now, or or 70-30 or whatever. So the GIC worked out at this point. The GIC it it, cha it saved money. Um, and I don't think the city has been asleep at the switch in being creative with the health care uh, policies. So I have to, uh, I, I, I will commend uh, the city on that. Also, uh, Susan Wright, I, she's not here. Um, she's wonderful, our finance director. She supports the override. <laughs> <laughs> that is where we differ. That completes phase two, and this is the, completes the end of the participation of these two gentlemen, and I think they deserve a huge round of applause for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, if, I, if I may, I'm here because nobody else would come here on my side. <laughs> well, you're, and they needed somebody. Um, now it's your turn. And we're turning over that microphone to people to have two minutes to talk about whether they are for or against the override, and we're going to rotate positions. So let's start off. Someone who would like to speak for two minutes in favor of the override. Jeff, you, you spoke already. Jeff, you spoke already. Go ahead. You want, yeah? You got two minutes. Do we still have like a Yes. A speaker opposing the override. Uh, this gentleman, right there. yeah, the, yeah, the microphone. No. Uh. <laughs> the guy in the striped shirt. Yeah, yeah, you have two minutes. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe DeBlaze. I live in uh, Ward Three on Valley Street. 
first of all, um, we live in a community that the demographics of this community are aging. And uh, the amount of people who are getting older and older are escalating, not getting smaller. We're not a young society, we're an old society. And uh, what are we doing to help the old people in our community who are on fixed income uh, to uh, be able to stay in their home without having to be institutionalized or moved to another community that where they might have lived for many, many years? <coughs> Uh, the council and our mayor have had years, years to fix this and have it. We need this fixed immediately because our society continues to get old. And uh, something has to be done so that people can stay in their homes. In addition to that, I look at this budget. We've had multiple overrides year after year to, and we continue to ask for more and more money. Uh, I was in business for 40 years and, it, and it, I had a budget where I continued to ask for more and more money. I would have been fired from my job. This, 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 this situation has to change so that we as a society and as a community live within our means and give our children what they need. That's all, thank you. Um, speaker in favor. Um, Pam. Uh, my name is Pamela Schwartz. I come here as uh, both, well, a city councilor, a board for um, a co-leader of Yes Our Hampton, which is a group of hundreds of volunteers across the city working to pass the override, and as a parent of three children in the public schools. And I am passionately in favor of this override because it really is the best choice and the only choice we have for preserving our basic services and what it is that makes us proud to call North Hampton our home. We have lost $35 million in state aid. If you look at what the state has given us in fiscal year 2002, and if they had level funded us, there is no mystery to this crisis. It is completely traceable to constant, persistent cuts in state aid. And we have tremendously effective leadership, thanks to Mayor Narkowitz and the other leaders on our school committee and council, council not myself included per se, but, um, but we have the leadership and we are up against a wall and I am scared. I am scared about what happens if this override fails. It is not a scare tactic when we're talking about 14 school staff positions and four police officers and our city's basic fiscal health. We need this override. It is the only solution we have. Then we need to win it and move on to make the necessary state change so we don't have to be put in this position again. But right now, it's time to take care of ourselves and do what we do best, which is vote yes. Thank you. An opponent, this gentleman right here. Yeah. Andrew Church, 180 North Spring Street. Perpetuity. It's a long time. The rest of my life, my son's life, his children, if he ever has them, their life. I think if you ask the kids in town, would they be happier having three more students in a classroom through their years at, at Northampton High, or being able to afford to live here once they're out of school and out of their homes, I'd be willing to bet that most of them would choose to be able to continue to live here in the town that they grew up. And a lot of people just can't, and I know number of people personally that have been forced to move out of this town because they can't afford the rents or they can't afford to buy a house here because of the prices. The other thing I want to say, and I want to get this in, you're projecting out four years 
here. For 20 years, I have listened to the city council and they have said over and over again, we can't set our budget until the state sets theirs. But you, now you can come up and you can project out four years and say we need two and a half million. Why are we going for perpetuity when you're talking about four years? Why wasn't this override considered for the time that you're talking about, four years? Speaker in favor of the override, uh, woman in purple there, I believe. Hi, I'm Sally Weiss. I live on 4th Street in North Fork. And I want to speak to the subject of hardship. And um, I want to put it into a, a little different context. I want to take it up above state aid to the federal government. Um, I, I don't know uh, a lot of you in the room, but I kind of sense that in this country, we're not too happy with the direction of our country right now. And we see that corporations are getting rich that we don't get, and banks um, got through somehow the crisis that took most of us down one way or the other. Um, in the morning paper in the Gazette, I saw Head Start and that um, cut, and that uh, points to the professionals. <coughs> Again, I, I'm a, I was a daycare teacher before I um, retired. And um, I think we have to realize that the national priorities are, uh, become Northampton's priorities. And um, the national priorities, are, I think, are something that citizens have to really scrutinize. I, Sorry to say that I don't think Congress does a very good job of scrutinizing our national priorities. I think they are kind of bought by the corporations, and I'll be up front. I'm part of the anti-war movement, so I think the Pentagon, um, I, I hate that Head Start kids um, will not have their spots and when <coughs> the military um, Congress is going to go way over sequestration minutes for the military. And um, I don't think <coughs> the defense of our country is going to be hurt um, if we keep things within some sort of balance. And I think we're out of that. And I think it hurts more families. Okay. An opponent? Um, is a woman? Yep. You know. Sue Timberlake um, in Florence. Uh, a newcomer to town, but I've come down for politics for a long time. Homeowner, barely employed. And I'm against the override. I probably wouldn't have been if it was 1.4 million, which is what we need. Um, it's 2.5 million. And to do the math, that means that it's $1.1 million that we're gonna do something else with. We're gonna put it in the bank. We're gonna take it out of my pocket and your pocket. And we're gonna put it in the bank to stabilize Northampton. And I don't really know if the teachers are going to be restored or not. I think if I saw a list of teachers and I knew they were going to be restored, after all, the mayor is the chair of the school committee in this city, not like where I came from, where they actually ran a little road. He's the chairman. So we don't even know who's going to be restored or what programs. So I moved here. I apologize to the longtime residents, but I'm going to vote no on this because it's $1.1 million that we don't need right now. And I heard 700,000 was going to be put in a stabilization stabilization fund, but that means that there's 400,000 that haven't been identified. So I'm really pleased with Susan Wright. She does a great job. I have her chart. I write it at home, and that's how I know that I don't know what those numbers mean. Mm. Okay. Um, gentleman with the red suspenders. I know people have difficulty paying.
dragging your feet from back. But you know what? You're going to have to bang through this every year from now on. This isn't something that's going to go away. And so the sequestration fund, if that's what you call this, is a good idea because it's not going away. And following what Sally said, I mean, we, we pay several trillion dollars for wars that were unnecessary and that we're still stuck in that is the reason the feds aren't giving the states the money that they were and the reason the states aren't giving us because they don't have it. I watch the Bell Patrick every year go through the same budget crisis the men are going through. So my view is let's keep this a wonderful city. They do have to dig in. And for $240 a year extra for an average house, what we would do would be unfathomable. Thank you. Gentlemen in the striped shirt. No, the other guy. My name is Lemon Angelino. I live in uh, Florence, 36 Shady Drive. I've lived here all my life, and, and I've never seen uh, so much rancor over the culver rides. They, they are so persistent now. Um, one of the things I've objected to, and I'm going to move to Yelp for this thing, I object to the fact that we have to have an override again on top of what we've already had. Many people have already said this could be damaging to a lot of people in this community. I have friends who are moving at the present time to Southampton because they can't afford to live here. We're passing an override, and the override is a, it's a segment which is an override, I think, as you call it, stabilization fund. Do we need to add that now, even if it passes? Why do you have to add that on top of what is already necessary? The stabilization fund, deal with it the next time around if you have to do it. It seems like every year we are running into an override situation. In our conversation on the phone, I indicated to you at some point, you have to bite the bullet. My background was business. And if we didn't meet our budget, we had to pay the price. We had to do things we didn't like. And they're not pleasant. So at some point, Southampton can't keep the staffing that it has. It's impossible. I bet you if I asked you what's the biggest nut in that budget, it's got to be payroll, it's got to be benefits. Those are a significant item in any budget. And you have to deal with those at some point. And you are, to your credit. And But there's more to be done. And if you have to lose some people, I'm sorry. It's just the same on the other side of the coin. People who can't afford to pay have to dig it up or give up something. So all I'm saying right now is, if you're gonna, if this thing even passes or even have it as a consideration, remove at least the, the stabilization fund. I don't know what that equates to in, in terms of what the rate would be. So at this point, I think you ought to look at maybe bringing more industry into town, mm -hmm. see if you can use your planner, more efficiency instead of grants. Get a job in this town. <laughs> Get the businesses in this town. Mm -hmm. That's what it would help. Um, draw override speaker, the woman in the blue. My bigger concern also is that it's snowballing a little. There are parents um, who are taking in this phrase and are saying, well, if the override doesn't pass it, they've already applied for school choice. They've applied for charter schools. Um, those costs our school system money. So if the override fails, not only will the education be affected, next year our school budget will be even worse off because we'll have to pay out more money for those students who are dropped in to go to another district or go to a charter school. And I worry about how this could snowball. Um, and then the second thing is, I do a, as an alumni interviewer for a major university, and I can't tell you how impressive the Northampton High School students are that I interview. Some of them would offer full scholarships, including tuition, books, airfare. Um, you know, that just was an amazing thing. I am terrified of having to pay for full college tuition. I would be more than happy to pay for this override as 
one-time deal if we need to repeat our schools and security for that they are now. Thank you. Um, and a gentleman in a striped shirt. Gonna, we're going to do one more pro, one more con, and that'll end it for the evening. So, um, why don't you come over? Well, <laughs> who's the boss here anyway? I'm voting for it, and I hope you do too. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Woman in the black here, and that'll end it. came to three of them, so you must have known. I, I was, because I heard about it when I was at the hairdresser's. 
for one of the women that was that came into the night directors from the city. She was talking like this, what's going on? And she talked about it. She said it was nothing else. Um, my three children, I just finished putting them for college. My oldest is going to have the doctorate this year. And they went to the school here. But when my daughter went to Smith College, she came home that night and said, Mommy, you wouldn't believe in my uh, science lab and the microscope and things that I have. I never had anything like that at the high school. When my son got a five in the AP biology test, he was studying in my dining room with a book that was published the year he was born. I mean, the teachers are excellent. They kill themselves. They buy supplies. They do everything. But I'm saying, don't stop. I'm paying all these taxes. And it's not that I'm ungrateful. It's just that the numbers don't lie. You know, I call the city. I call the state. Right. I call everywhere. And the same thing. The education is spending too much money. And I don't get a straight answer. I get messages in your office. You never call me back. The girls didn't give you a message, I guess. But it's frustrating. I want to I thank everybody for coming. I think this has been an incredibly good exchange. I think all the important points on both sides came out. This is a hard decision for a lot of people. There's a lot here that people are going to think about and should think about. This is an important issue, an important decision. And we'll see all of you at the polls on Tuesday, and I hope we have a huge turnout so the community can record itself um, in, to the greatest degree possible. Thank you again for coming, and we appreciate you being here.